Welcome, Kyle. Welcome, Kyle. Thanks so much for joining me today. I'm happy to have you on. I'm glad we could get this done. So, uh, yeah, welcome. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. I, I love your uh, digital nomad. That's a, I've never had an extended conversation with someone that is in that world, and I think that's super cool. Yeah, it's it's it can have its moments where you're just tired of traveling, but <laughs> so it's you know it's just like anything in life, you know, the, or maybe now in this social media world that we have, right? It's it's um uh, there's a bad and a good to everything, right? So be careful what you ask for, but, <laughs> right. but I, I I love it, and I've been um changing how I do it as I go along, but but yeah. But uh, why don't you just go ahead and um, give us a little introduction, uh, you know, what you do and, and who you are. Sure. Well, I'm not a digital nomad, so I have a, I have a home in the Pacific Northwest. I've got a couple or three kids and a wife, and I've been, we've been living up here for about a decade, moved from California and came up here to be near family. Didn't know what I was going to do when we moved up here. I used to run a men's mentoring program, was there for nine and a half years and didn't know what to do when we moved up here. I applied to 50 jobs and got one interview. And that was back in 2014. So don't know why it worked out that way, but that one interview turned into a senior living job that was terrible. So I quit that job and then applied for another, I think it was another 40 jobs and then got two interviews and ended up finally getting a job in HR, which was just crazy to me because I've got the degree. I've got, I ran a business for a little while, ran a, a pet resort and did all kinds of things, but nobody cared, which is fine because you learn lessons and all that. But the thread was all of it had to do with mentoring and coaching and supporting people. And so when I realized that that's really my passion, not necessarily HR, then I went for it and went after, went after the coaching world and started my business six years ago. And now I run Gillette Solutions. So that was a, it was a fun journey, <laughs> but frustrating in the midst of that, those first few years here in the Pacific Northwest, trying to figure out what am I going to do with myself? Why don't you tell me a little bit about how you ended up doing uh, mentoring or men's, men's mentoring, right? Because it's not, I mean, nowadays, I feel like it's a lot more pervasive, uh, you know, with people like Connor Beaton and uh, a little bit more, I guess, social media uh, exposure. Right. But it's it, I mean, it wasn't on my radar. I didn't even know what it was until a few years ago. I mean, I read uh, No More Mr. Nice Guy, you know, and I feel like that's the the, you know, opening the can of worms uh, for a lot of people. And uh, yeah, like it's now men's work is a is a term. Right. But before I feel like it wasn't. So I'm curious how you ended up, you know, 10 years ago looking into it. Sure. Yeah, I was in college. And I was sitting at my desk. It was makeshift desk. It was two by fours and a sheet of plywood. That was my, my desk. And I had an old big giant Dell monitor in front of me. And I remember my friend called me and I'd gone on a trip to India with him. And he came back. We lived in the same area, which is uh, San Luis Obispo. And he called me and said, hey, there's this job opening at this men's mentoring program. And so this is, this is 2005. And I'm basically 40 pounds overweight, terrified to be an adult because I'm 22 years old and getting ready to graduate college and go on into to real life. And I need to make a living for myself and all this kind of thing. So he tells me about this program. And basically my job would be to live in the house with these guys up to six guys, 18 to 25 years old. They're struggling in life and off track and really lost. So I'm hearing him and intrigued by it, but mostly because that's who I am at that time. I'm the one that's lost, struggling in life and off track and all these things. But they want me to lead. And I'm going, that's kind of nuts. But anyway, so I, I went to the interview and it's on this 20 acre farm with that has a pet resort that we sold cars and we now they do dog training. There's all kinds of stuff that happens, but there's I drive onto the property. There's dogs barking at me through this chain link fence, which is the daycare area. They're happy dogs, but they're barking at me. Drive over the bridge, park next next to the house built in 1885. It's an old farm area. And there's two barns, this house, all this stuff. And I'm like, wow, this is crazy. It's like really idyllic setting, green lawn, American flag, all this stuff. And I'm going, this, this could work. Go inside, meet the president, meet the executive director of the program. 
We talk for an hour and a half. And the whole time, I just feel like someone's pushing me into the couch that I'm sitting in. Just like, I, you belong here. You need to stay here. So at the end of the interview, the president, his name's Jack, he asks me, do you want the job? And what it means to accept the job is I got to graduate college still, but then I'm moving out of my apartment with my buddies and moving into this house, this farmhouse with some other strange dude that I'm in the same room with, and then four to six other guys that I'm supposed to be leading somehow. So I say yes, because why not? <laughs> But it meant room and board and it meant all kinds of things beyond the logistics of it. But fast forward and I ended up being there for nine and a half years. And I didn't live in the program for nine and a half years. I lived there for a year and then ended up doing other roles like running the pet resort and then running the program. And that was really where mentorship, where I was the mentor began for me. Prior to that, uh, because of my involvement with church, I'd been mentored quite a bit in my experience. And so I was very exposed to it and I loved it. And I, I find extreme value from it. Uh, but that was, that was the journey. And I'm just grateful that I had all the mentoring that I got during that time because the president mentored me for nine and a half years, every, every Tuesday at lunch, an hour and a half. And he was a serial entrepreneur, sold, sold a few businesses and retired in his early fifties. And he hasn't taken a paycheck since. And so I got the wisdom of him dumped on me for almost 10 years. Just, I couldn't be really couldn't be luckier, but he, between him and my dad, I was very fortunate to have great mentorship. Yeah, the value of mentorship uh, is, it just can't be explained, right? I think uh, one of the big things that a lot of people ask though is how do you find a mentor? And I think they just fall in your lap, right? Like if you're, it's sort of like anything where if you're trying too hard to find something, you won't find it uh, or you'll give off like a needy a needy vibe, and then the 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 universe doesn't want to give it to you. So I'm curious if you have any uh, suggestions as to how you might find a mentor and and how you might distinguish a good one from a bad one. Sure. Yeah. I think I couldn't speak for the process for women. I don't. I don't know. But for men, I think there's one. There's one area that I talk about second here that is very simple and straightforward. The the first area though would be. I mean, you just got to ask. You got to know what you're looking for. And I remember when we first started at this church that we're going to, I was talking to the pastor. I said, hey, I'm looking for someone to mentor me that runs, that has really good business experience, but also is willing to talk about God. And mentorship doesn't have to include conversations about God by any means, but that's important to me. So I was looking for someone like that. And he came back to me like a day later. Or No, it was in the same, it was in the same conversation. He said, I know the perfect person. So the key there was I knew what I was looking for. And then you start telling people about it and someone will just come up. Like you said, someone will just end up showing up, but you got to kind of define who you're looking for. And so I had to find it, put it out there. And then someone very quickly found me a mentor and we've been, he's been mentoring me now for three, uh, I think it's three years now. We're meeting next Wednesday and we meet every other week, basically. So that's huge. Second, uh, I actually run a program. It's, it's a mentoring and business coaching program for, for men. It's called Project 1024. And so if guys are looking for that type of support, that accountability, that interaction, and a way to grow their business and not feel like they're on an island, that's exactly what the program is for. It's a six-phase process that I walk them through to help them go from wherever they are now to living on the mission that they have for their business and their life, right? So um, clearly another way is to join a group of men that are already in this type of mastermind slash building each other up type context. And that's because I got to experience that for 10 years in that program as a part of, I'm like, this is beautiful. This type of work, this type of impact is absolutely enormous, not just for someone's business, but for their whole lives. And so I started the, the program at the beginning of this month and I've got, there's nine members or eight members now. So it's been, it's been cool to, to be working with them. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. I think, you know, well, the question that comes to mind is why men's work, like why only men, right? And there's a lot of charged, uh, maybe politically charged, um, you know, feeling to that, right? But 
I always tell people that, you know, we're very different in the way that we think. And I think it's becoming more common knowledge that the standard, um, I guess, uh, just your standard therapy is more geared towards uh, the feminine and the, the, the female mind. So, uh, and even like if, if you get into marriage counseling, it's very fe female centric, right? Um, uh, and like just the other day, I think I saw some, some, like a therapist saying like, oh, don't, I, I, it might've been a joke. I don't know, but it was like, don't like, don't just listen to the woman in marriage, marriage counseling. So, um, mm. and it, it, I think it's, uh, I think it's a true statement, right? But so, yeah, I guess my, 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 cause a lot of guys don't feel heard, right? Uh, which that statement probably 10, 20 years ago was, would, would have gotten you some, <laughs> some wrath, right? But, uh, so yeah, I'm just, I guess the question, uh, in short is why only, why only men? Sure. I'm not a woman, <laughs> first of all. So I coach women for sure. And I help them tremendously as well in my one-to-one -one context, but there's no way I'm going to do a women's group as a man. So that's not going to work for me at all. They need them and it's great for them too, for a hundred percent. Uh, but for me, it's my calling. Uh, I've been doing it now for 20 years, you know, since I was, well, not quite 20 years, but close to it. Since I was about 20, I've, I've been mentoring men in various roles. And now I basically do it professionally. And it's now called coaching because I'm helping them to make money for their business and their family. Uh, but, but I think men, they wreck families and they wreck businesses generally more often than women. Okay. So if you think about a family that's all messed up, it's not because the mom's absent. It's because the dad's absent. When a business gets all screwed up, it's not because some woman screwed it up. It's because a man screwed it up. And it could be because they're the owner or because they did something horrible in the organization or they lied or whatever. Now, I know that women can mess things up too. <laughs> and not all men mess up things. That's not what I'm saying. But generally speaking, my heart is if I can help those guys change their mindsets and habits before they start making poor decisions, before they create the habits of poor decisions and impact their lives and impact their families because of that. Now I'm preventing future problems. And in my coaching, my work is to prevent future problems and solve future problems. I, yeah, sure. It's important to solve current problems, but I want to get paid for solving problems that we're preventing today that would have occurred a year, two to three to five years from now. And so my work with the guys in the group and my work with my clients one-to-one -one is about doing the mindset and habit work to make adjustments today that five years down the road will make them a completely different person and their business a completely different entity because of the, the results and the success they're getting today, right? And that's, it's a joy to me. It's truly a joy to me. And I love spending the time doing it. I do it for free and I do it for paid. And I'll do it until I'm dead because it's wonderful. And it's, it's, again, it's my calling. I love how you distinguished coaching there, because I think that's one of the things that just doesn't make sense for men in a sort of a uh, therapy setting, right? Because coaching sort of entails giving a person action items, right? It's, it, it, it's, it, it's giving a, uh, action oriented person or a goal sorry a goal oriented person uh, goals to achieve right it's not just sit on a couch and talk about yourself which to most men sounds horrible um, <laughs> so you know like and, and especially when you like the group setting is even more productive I feel because uh, I think I'm, I'm not sure if I read an article that or maybe it was a study uh, an article about study <laughs> that uh, that you know, men more easily talk to each other when they're uh, going towards a common goal. So I think yep. they, they put a bunch of guys together and told them to fix something, I forget, like, or work on a, on a car, you know, on a, mo on, a, on a motor or something like that. And they were all working to solve something. And then that's when they talked to each other, right? It was, it, I think they called it lateral speaking versus, yeah. uh, uh, it's direct speaking, right? Where it's like, women will sit face to face, look each other in the eyes and then 
talk about their feelings or whatever it is, right? Guy, guys are more um, sort of passively mentioning it to each other and, and helping each other along the, along the way. So it's yeah. a difference. Two summers ago, my friend turned, turned 40 or maybe he was a little bit older, but whatever. He, he hit kind of that milestone age mm -hmm. and the pandemic had hit. And so the plan was to do something big but we couldn't because the pandemic was in the way when he was turning 40. And so he had to delay this thing. And so two summers ago we did it and we went and climbed Mount Shasta together, which is 14,400 something foot peak in California. And it's a really amazing thing <laughs> to do. And he had invited 17 guys knowing that only eight people total could go. And it ended up being eight people went. And I knew about half the guys and I didn't know the other half. What was really amazing is we all had a common goal, like you're talking about, which was get to the summit. And we, we then did the work of training for it. Some of us got to train together, other, others of us had to train alone, but it was this common goal that we could work towards and we had accountability because of it, right? Which is a huge thing that men struggle with is accountability. And so having this common goal created that accountability and we would check in with each other via this thread that we had going. You know, I did this many miles this week. I, you know, I did this 1500 foot elevation gain in 45 minutes and, you know, I'm carrying 50 pounds and we're just talking about what we're doing. It's really inspiring. Then we all get there and one guy couldn't make it. He got, he got, um, it's not, it's not called elevation sickness, but basically he got real sick because it was the elevation, but the other seven, we all made it. And I've never gotten so close to guys so quickly in my life. Like I knew some of the guys already. And two of them are my best friends and I love those guys. But the other six, I drew so close to so quickly. And it's true that intentional going towards a specific goal together, even if the reason behind going for that goal is different, you still have this mutual goal is absolutely huge. And part of why I have a roadmap for my mastermind is so that there is a common goal at the end, which is to live on mission, whatever their mission is for their business and their life. We're all going towards achieving that. And that gives you direction. It's like a lighthouse so that when it's foggy and confusing, you still have that fuzzy light in the distance that you know you're going after. And so that's a, that's a huge component. Um, and I think the other part is that lateral, like you're saying. When you're, when you're hiking a mountain, you're not looking at each other. <laughs> you're one guy's in front of you and one guy's behind you and you're just kind of chatting all the way up. And you're struggling together. So you have those components, common goal, a common struggle, and you, you're you not in this kind of weird, intimate setting, even though it is intimate, it's not a weird, intimate set, mm -hmm. right? You need all three of those components to, to really grow in any relationship. You need that intimacy, you need a common goal, uh, and you need a, you know, to be on the journey together. Mm -hmm. So that was a blast. It was fantastic. And, and I will forever remember that experience. Man, I may, may take your idea because I'm turning 30 this year and uh, I need to, <laughs> I've been looking for an idea. So maybe, maybe, uh, maybe I'll do that. <laughs> awesome. Cool, cool. Well, uh, a uh, question I had from something you said earlier is uh, imposter syndrome, right? So um, when you first got started coaching in uh, the farm, forgive me if that's not what it was, or I forget what it was called. Um, did you feel that? I mean, you were just out of college. Uh, and I feel like any, uh, I've noticed that any new chapter in life, any new venture, there's always going to be a, a level of imposter syndrome. I mean, you know, whether it, I remember I felt it uh, when I started my, my master's degree, I, I, you know, I, I, I went to Stanford and, uh, you know, I was like, oh, I don't deserve to be here. You know, like all these geniuses or something around me. And then you, I, the first day in class I, or the first week or something like that, I remember I, uh, I was like, oh, no, these, these are just normal, normal people just like me. Right. You know, I mean, they're just hardworking. So then they, that's why they got into a good university, you know. But, uh, but yeah, there was nothing, I, you know, there was always, I mean, maybe there was a one or two guys that were just brilliant. But um but in general, you know, that imposter syndrome started to wane. And I'm curious if you felt that. And I, and I, and I admit that I, I want to start coaching. And I, I, 
you know, that's one thing that I've, that I'm working on sort of getting past the imposter syndrome. Sure. Yeah. I, I think it's a, what I say is it's a fact. If you don't feel like a fake, you're not going to grow. Mm. What's also true is it's a fact that when you take a risk, you will grow. And to me, when you feel like a fake, that's imposter. And when you take a risk and you feel like a fake and it feels uncomfortable, you're going to grow. And that's a good thing. So to me, imposter is a sign that you're in a place of growth. It's a great automatic feedback system. So if I'm experiencing imposter syndrome if, or if whoever's listening is experiencing that, awesome. Embrace it because there's a lesson in it. There's some sort of a learning lesson. So when I first, it was called Alpha Academy or it is called Alpha Academy. When I was first in it, I, like I said, I was 40 pounds overweight, afraid of pursuing life and not feeling like I could help some guy that's just two years younger than me or, or four years younger than me. Like, what, what am I doing? And then I went, you know what? I just need to take action. And so I trained for a half marathon, ran that half marathon, lost all the weight, and I killed it in the half marathon, right? And then I got a job outside of working in the program. And so I started a personal training business in the middle of running the, pro in the middle of being in the program. I started a personal training business and I started reading a ton of books to help these guys because they needed help and they, they weren't going to be reading those books. And so I needed to, to do the reading and I could help them out. And I had to figure out how to ask good questions and all kinds of stuff like that. So the imposter in me was a reminder to pursue the things that, that made me uncomfortable. What do you do though, when you're afraid to pursue the things that make you uncomfortable? Let's go back to the accountability partner, right? That's where, when you have that accountability partner, you can let that guy know, Hey, or that woman know if, if you're a woman, uh, that, you know, I'm feeling really uncomfortable. I'm not, I'm not sure what to do next or whatever you're experiencing. You share it with them and you get vulnerable and that vulnerability, they don't even have to have an answer for you. That vulnerability in and of itself opens up what's possible. So. I mean, ultimately I'm really hitting, hinting at my leadership blueprint. It's a four pillar process that I talk to my clients about. And the first one is be a self-aware leader. So if I'm aware of where I feel like I'm an imposter, that's wonderful because now I got that feedback, like I was saying before, and then I can place some accountability, which is the L lead with accountability, get some accountability in there to do something about this imposter, the sphere that I have. And then from there. The you is use a growth mindset. So as I experience this imposter, as I experience these struggles, then I go, you know what? I can grow in this. Even if it's incremental, 1%, I can still grow. And that's great. And then finally, once you get those three in place, now you get to empower others, which is the E in blue. And as I, as I get to empower others, what happens? I feel like a fake again. I feel like an imposter. <laughs> so you go right back around and you go, okay, I'm aware of where I stand. What accountability do I need in place to help me to, to grow beyond this? And then the cycle just goes and goes and goes. And it's this beautiful upward spiral of growth and development as a human. And then you're bringing other people with you because you're empowering them along the way. So that's my long yeah. end. <laughs> no, I like it. I like it. I mean, it's sort of that, uh, I don't know if you've heard that saying, like the obstacle is the way or yeah. um, what is it? Uh, the the remedy is in the poison, sort of a different, ver different variations of that. But um, yeah, when, when you were talking there, something that came to mind is just how imposter syndrome is just a different form of fear, really, like a fear that you're not enough. And so uh, the reason I mentioned uh, that the remedy is the poison, right, is, is that usually the right way to go is in the direction of fear um so it's it's almost like you can use it like a signpost or uh sort of a compass if you will uh and you can use it to guide your life right and it's so counterintuitive it's like why are you gonna just follow fear for the rest of your life right <laughs> like like i just want to be comfortable i just want to relax and um I feel like the, the the full circle of that though is that these things that you fear in the moment, if you were present, you wouldn't really fear, right? They're not they're sort of ideas in your head that you tell yourself you should fear. Um and they're not and they're not even real, right? Because you're 
at that point projecting into the future um, and you're not uh, just being present, right? If you look around, okay, like I'm safe. I'm in right now. I'm, I'm between these four walls. I'm nothing, nothing's going wrong, but, uh, but yeah, but fear is a powerful uh, emotion. So yeah, there's a wise man once said, who of you by worrying can add a single hour to your life? Mm-hmm. And it, it's actually from Matthew six and it's Jesus talking, but basically worry is about let, let me give you a backstory on this first. So, and then I'll give you my own example. When I worked at the pet resort, I was scooping crap <laughs> in the in the daycare, and I was dumping it into the box that they used for that. And I was I left the little the cage area where the dogs were playing together, and I looked, and I saw these dogs. They were just having a freaking blast. They were, it was so much fun, and and I had this epiphany. I realized that. They don't worry about anything. They're just present. They're just there. That's it. They don't think about the dog that bit them before or fought with them before. They don't think about that they need to eat food. They're just present. That's it. There's no other thing that's happening with them. So they don't know how to worry because worry is about controlling time. Worry is about control, generally speaking. And so is anxiety. So when I go and recognize, and this is what happened to me at that moment, I recognize that I don't have to worry. Because either I want to stop time, speed time up, or slow it down. That's it. Those are the things that I'm trying to do when I worry. I want to get past the event. I don't want to do the event at all, so I want to stop time. Or I want to slow things down so I can do do the thing better. Or, you know, prepare a little bit longer or whatever. Mm -hmm. I can't do that, and I never will be able to. So in that moment, I decided I'm not going to worry anymore. And for the most part, anxiety and worry has really not been a thing for me. I have, I've had it, of course, but for the most part, that realization that who of you by worrying can add a, add a single hour to your life, that clicked in such a powerful way for me. And for people, I think this is where anxiety comes in. They just, they get so anxious about what's upcoming and what they don't recognize is that in our brains, the, where our brains fire up as it relates to anxiety and as it relates to excitement is the same. It's the same area of the brain. And so we constantly confuse excitement or yes, excitement for anxiety. When, when you think about this is what would happen to me. I used to be terrified of public speaking. I would be terrified to be on a podcast, but I knew it was something I should do to promote my business. And I like to t- talk to strangers. I like to do, be on podcasts. It's fun to get to know people. But, you know, during the pandemic, we would do networking calls. And I don't know if you've ever done those networking calls or not, but you, you introduce yourself. Maybe you're in a, in, a, in a room, in a you know, live room or whatever, you're not on Zoom, but you're in person. And you have to do an elevator pitch, quote unquote. And you have 30 seconds to say who you are and what you do. I would be shaking as I'm getting ready to share it. My heart would be just pitter pattering for real. And then when I would talk, you could hear the shaking in my voice because I was so nervous to share for 30 seconds. Now I do four hour long workshops with, with organizations, with executives, and I love it. It's so much fun. And yeah, I'm a little bit nervous, but I've learned that that nervousness is actually excitement because I get the opportunity to teach these people and learn from them too, because I do them in more of a workshop context where we're asking a lot of questions. So it's just a lot of fun. That little brain pivot was huge for me. To, and then, of course, I do Toastmasters and I put myself into positions to speak. So I'm also training myself. Um, so I know I, I might have rambled on about this, but ultimately, worry is about controlling time and you can't do that. So is there a component of dopamine, right? Where you're sort of incentivized to want to be anxious because... You want to be uh, excited, so and your maybe your body confuses the two, and and there's a bit of a vicious cycle there. I think there could be some truth to that. I couldn't answer that kind of from a scientific angle uh, or a biological angle, but I think anxiety is a, is rewarding in our culture. So when when someone talks about how they're anxious, they get a lot of attention for it, and they people often will label themselves like that. I'm, I'm anxious. I get anxious about things. Mm. And I, 
I'm a worrier. And they just keep labeling themselves. The thing about our unconscious mind is what we say gets programmed into it. It's called neuro-linguistic programming. And so if I say that I'm an anxious person, I'm basically setting a goal for my unconscious mind. And my unconscious is the goal getter. So the conscious is the goal setter and my unconscious is the goal getter. So if I consistently say to myself that I'm anxious, then my brain says, okay, awesome, let's go get that. Because it doesn't have a standard of right and wrong. It just wants to do. Now you have a conscious, like a, you have a, a moral compass and I do too, but our unconscious mind doesn't. We uh, people do, but our, our brains don't. So I tell it to go do something enough, like this is annoying, this is annoying, this is annoying, then it's going to need to prove that to be true. And since our brain takes in two to 11 million bits of information every second, when I'm experiencing someone or something and I tell my brain it's going to be a terrible experience, there's going to be plenty of bits of information to prove that to be true. But if I tell myself that this interview with you is going to be a great experience, there's going to be plenty of bits of information that's going to prove that to be true. Either way can be right, but my unconscious is going to deliver whatever I, whatever I consciously tell myself that I want delivered to. Me. And then ultimately, that's where the habits come in. If I have the habit of joy, the habit of gratitude, the habit of excitement, of risk, all those things, then I don't have to try to program myself all the time. It's programmed into my habits. And then my unconscious delivers the things that I want habitually to me and then gets the results that I want. Right. It reminds me of, uh, I was just talking about this yesterday where you, you can set a goal for yourself. Like, you know, I, whether it be personal or, or business, right. You know, I'm going to make X amount of money this year or something like that. Right. Uh, but it can just be like, okay, I'm going to go to the gym every day this week or every, you know, once a week for the next year. Um, and when you set a goal for yourself like that, or, um, and it can, it can be pretty big, actually. Like I, I've, I've realized like you can set some pretty big goals and like, it's this, it's a similar thing. I, I, I was thinking of it from a point of view of like, okay, the universe is giving me what I'm asking for. But at the same time, what you're saying is like, okay, my subconscious mind is looking for it as well. Yep. Um, so it's sort of working, uh, working in unison, right? Or are there two, two things coming to give you what you want? So I agree. There's a synergy there for me. It's, it's God is, I have these goals and, and God is helping me achieve them. And then he's given me an unconscious mind, a very, very powerful supercomputer to help figure out where those are, but they're synergistic together. And you put those together and you, well, all right, firework, <laughs> you get fireworks. There you go. <laughs> you, you put those together and you climb a 14,000 foot mountain. You put those together and you're in the best shape you've ever been when you're 40, which is where I am. Right. I, I besides when I was doing water polo in high school, I think I'm in the best shape I've ever been, but I'm 40. Like that's crazy, mm -hmm. but that's a goal I set, you know, to make, have a six figure business. That's a goal I set. I did it. Those are the things that you put out there. And if you don't put them out there, that's very unlikely that they're going to happen. But the missing piece that people miss all the time, well, two pieces is one, accountability. They don't have the accountability to help them to continue to follow through because none of us do anything on our own. No matter what it is, we have to have that support. I don't care what it is. We have support in some way, shape, or form. Even if it was in the past that we got that support, it got us to where we are. Preferably, you have it in the present too. And number two, the first step to change is release. And people get this all mixed up. They don't think about the most important step to, to change is release. And, and what I mean by that is if I want to start a business, if I want to get married, if I want to be much more successful in business, if whatever the goal is for the people that are listening, if you have these doubts, these limiting beliefs, these negative emotions tied to past experiences in your life, you're not going to be able to get there. Weight loss is a great example. People want to lose weight. Then what happens? They lose the weight, they're doing well, and then they gain it back and sometimes more. It's because they didn't let go of the, the feelings that they have about their weight. They didn't let go about the limiting beliefs they have about who they can be physically and health-wise. And health 
once you drop that baggage, get rid of all that head trash, now the likelihood of achieving what you want to achieve skyrockets because that there's it doesn't it's not like a rubber band anymore. You've snipped that rubber band. All that baggage you've been dragging with you has you're, you've let go of it. You know, you travel. Less baggage is easier. <laughs> Trust me. Less baggage equals <laughs> more freedom. <laughs> And this is, yeah. this is then what happens. Then you have the freedom to create from a place of clarity because your mind's not cluttered with all that head trash and stinking thinking, if you will. So. Yeah, I remember, you can, I feel like you can feel it too. I remember I, I, I met this lady once and she was, she just immediately was like, you, you carry around a lot of anxiety. And, and, uh, and it, I was like, yeah, you're right, I do. <laughs> And it, and it made me sort of realize, um, and w I feel like women in, in general are also more in tune to that. So that's probably why she could tell more, more so than somebody else. But, uh, obviously I've worked on it, but, um, I, I guess my point is that there's a lot of other factors that you're not realizing that sort of bubble up and come through, right? If you're a calmer person, more people are attracted to you, you'll, You'll, um, you know, if you're an, int if, if you open up and are more interesting, more people will want to be around you and you'll attract, you know, so it's sort of a cascade of events, I feel, or a, uh, you know, a, a cascading um, uh, stream of events. Yeah. So it's, it's an interesting thing, you know, it's, and it's a combination, I feel, of, There, there is a certain, you know, I, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to make this sort of a religious thing, but there is a certain amount of faith, um, whether it be in yourself or in the universe that you also need to carry. Right. Um, and I'm curious, like how that is something that you, that you, um, that you, that you teach, you know, because it's not an easy thing. I mean, I, I realize uh, that you may give it from a, from a religious standpoint, but, um, how can you really have faith in yourself? How can you have faith in the universe? How can you have faith that things will go the right way? Cause oftentimes I feel like that's the most difficult part of letting go of the baggage, letting go of your anxiety, letting go of all these things, um, is, is having faith that things will go right. And part of it, I feel is knowing that you know, and having confidence in yourself and saying, I am, I'm a capable person. I can figure it out. Um, but one thing that I've noticed is the more faith I have, the more things go my way. Uh, so I'm, yeah, I'm curious uh, from a teaching standpoint, like how can you really show that, uh, or how can you help share that message? Right. If that makes any sense. Yeah, I think so. What comes to mind is a single word, and that's relationship. Four of them, though. So when I say relationship, there's four different layers to it. And we'll start at the, quote, bottom layer. So the bottom layer would be relationship with what you want to achieve. So the cl more relationship you, you have with what you want to achieve, the more likelihood it will happen. A couple of ways that you can look at that. One would be, do I spend time with my goal. And I don't mean just working on it. Yes, that's important, of course. But I mean looking at it and going, this is what I want to achieve. This is what it looks like to achieve it. So back to the unconscious mind, I'm going, I, I want to generate $250,000 in revenue this year. Okay, great. What is, how can I create a relationship with that? Well, I need to put it in front of me consistently. I need to set milestones. I need to create these contexts where I can have a relationship with that goal, right? And then my mind goes and gets it. One really, really powerful way to do that is to project out into the future what it's like to have achieved that goal and project a specific moment that you know you've arrived at achieving that goal. So I create a relationship with that moment. I'm going to be, it'll be at the end of a retreat with 25 guys. And we had this beautiful experience. It's going to be in the wilderness. And I have had some really powerful insights. And so have they, and we're laughing and we're having a great time, right? So there's more details to it, but I've, I'm, I've pictured this many, many times because I have a relationship with that goal. Now, 
Will I get exactly that? No, not necessarily, but that's okay. So I'm going to shoot as high as possible in that relationship, just like you do with a significant other or a friendship or whatever. You shoot as high as possible and you're not settling. You're just going after it. And what happens happens because we can't control it, but we can set a tone. So relationship with the goal. Number two is relationship with others, right? So if, if I want to be moving forward, if I want to be progressing, I need to be having relationship with others. If I want to be in tune with what purpose for myself and my life, I need to bring others with me and I want to help them get there too. So spending time and having a relationship with them. Third is relationship with self. Do I spend time in silence by myself, hearing my own thoughts? Do I know my own inner voice? Do I spend five minutes a day or more trying to hear my own inner voice? If people were to do that and that voice were to be able to speak out loud and share what it's saying, and you were to speak that way to a friend, you would never have friends because our inner voice is horrible most of the time until you begin to have a relationship with yourself and you hear your inner voice and you understand what you're saying. And then you change the information. You change your habits of speaking to yourself, which then your unconscious mind goes and gets those positive things. So that's the third relationship that inner voice basically with yourself. Scripture says, love, love your neighbor as yourself, you know, so loving yourself. Fourth would be for me, it's a relationship with God because I can't have a relationship with the universe. The universe is, is this empty thing that doesn't actually exist in, in terms of a relationship. I just can't, but I can with, with God and so for me, it's spending time in that relationship. And for me, that's prayer, that's meditation, that's reading the Bible, and that's spending time with other people that have a relationship with God as well. So I think religion is trash, but I think relationship is beautiful in all four of these areas. Because re religion... that too before. Yeah. Religion is about tasks and about do this, don't do that. Relationship right. is about love and connection, right? So in all four of these areas, that's what I want as deeply as possible. I feel like relationships are um, underrated, I would say, in modern culture, especially here in the U.S., I feel. Um, not to talk ill, you know, of the U.S., but, you know, as I travel around, relationships are much more important and family is more important. Um, you know, that's a sort of painting with a broad brush, but, um, you know, we, we do have more of an individualistic culture here in the U.S. and um, it's an underrated thing to go find your tribe, right? Um, whether it be in business and finding a business group, a men's group, um, you know, if, like you were saying, if, if you are religious and you want to go find a, a group of people that, I mean, that's what really, um, sort of going to church is right. Sort of being with other people, uh, that are of your same faith. Right. Uh, so whatever it is that you want to find more people of, um, that's, that's what, that's what groups are for. It's sort of a, sort of a, it sounds like a, a dumb statement, but, um, many people don't go and search for that group. And, um, and I feel like part of it is because they want to do things by themselves. Um, you know, that's something that even I noticed in myself is like, if I didn't do it by myself, did I really do it? Um, and you realize that in life you depend on everybody all the time. There is no doing it by yourself. Uh, so you might as well get as much help as people are willing to give you, uh, you know, whether it's support or, um, uh, what's the word that you used? Uh, just making sure that, that you, you continue down your, um, not dependability, but, um, somebody that you can support to make sure that you keep on going down the, down your goal and continue along, um, towards your, towards your task, towards your goal. Uh, accountability buddy is, is the word they use or accountability. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, there's not really a question here, but I just wanted to, I just felt like, felt like saying that, but, um, yeah, but why don't we go ahead and, and just uh, end a little bit with uh, what your future goals are and uh, 
yeah like where 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 do you think where do you think you're going to be in in 10 years what's your what's what are your what are your what are your goals <laughs> yeah so with my clients one of the things that i do with them is have them create what's called an avatar and if you see a blue person in your mind that's totally fine because <laughs> the idea come does come from that movie and it's it's the idea of who do i want to be 5 to 20 years from now and so I don't have a 10 year target. I have a five year target. So I can't actually speak to the 10 year, but I can speak to the five year. And I have my clients do this. I go, where, where do you want to be? Who do you want to be? It's about being spiritually, emotionally, mentally, and physically. Who do you want to be five years from now? And for me, I have some very clear intentions of who I am going to be. Okay. And then I create that picture in my mind of what it's going to be like when I arrive there. So when it comes to spiritually, there's just like a deeper and, and deeper relationship I'll have with God. When it comes to mentally, it has to do with my ability to connect with other people men mentally as well. So what I mean is I want to be world-class as it relates to helping people with their, not their mental problems, because that's for counselors, but more with their, their own self-mastery, right? I want to be world-class in that area. And I'm working towards that every single freaking day. <laughs> um, Physically, I want to be, or well, emotionally, I want to be this like rock and stability for everyone around me. Now, I need the support myself to get there, but that's, that's the five-year goal as well. And then physically, I want to be as healthy as someone 20 years younger than me that's healthy also, right? So when I'm 60, I want to be like a healthy 40-year-old. And I'm working towards all of those things. So that's, those are my goals. And you can tie some numbers to that kind of stuff because part of it on the career is I want to build a mastermind with a prox or a, a community with approximately 350 guys in it that are all going towards the same target. I've got some financial goals of giving away $50,000 five times, but by the time I'm 45. And then I've got some family goals with travel um, and trips to other countries to serve other people. Uh, and then I've got some other physical goals as it relates to very specific things I want to be able to do. Um, so... I have all those things in place and I literally have the $50,000 checks right here for those businesses that aren't signed or dated because I don't have the money at this point, but that right. I want to make it happen. So I've got this visual for myself. When I sit at my desk, I see it every day. So that's what I'm pursuing right now. That's great. I think you need to give to be able to receive, right? So, um, and that, that goes along with money and, and anything in life. And I like that you mentioned, you know, the physical, the emotional, all the different goals, because a lot of people sort of go into their basically monk mode and are just business, 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 like focusing on, and they sort of, they forget their health. They forget everything else that's important in life. Because at the end of the day, like, I guess you have to define what's important to you, right? And I feel like family is probably more important than how well you do in your business, right? So you, you need to just, I mean, and there's, I'm sure there's a small percentage uh, especially of men that would say, no, the only thing that's important is business, right? So, and that's fine. It's just, you have to sort of be clear about what, what your goals are and where you want to go. Um, uh, cause if not, you're doing yourself a disservice. Um, but, uh, but beautiful. Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks for sharing those goals. Uh, and I usually just end with, uh, any books that you might recommend. And then if you want to just share your, um, your social media, your, how people can find you and all that good stuff. Um, whether you one book or three books or however, you know, go, sure. go crazy if you want, but yeah. For sure. I'm going to, I'm going to self promote <laughs> for a moment here. I wrote a book called That's right funny. now leadership, a four part framework for today's leaders. And I hinted at it with the, the blueprint leadership, uh, you know, that framework. And I hinted at it with some of the mindsets and habits that I spoke about. So a lot of that content is in that book. In terms of other books, I've read so many good books recently. It's like I've been real fortunate to stumble on some good books. I, I'm going to go with one that I read and then did a program with from probably two and a half years ago. It's called, it's called um, Time to Think by Nancy Klein. And the reason I recommend it is because we've really leaned into the idea of relationships in this conversation. And her book is all about learning how to listen and giving people time to think. And when you give people time to think, you're truly 
empowering them. And we didn't even get to get to that. It's one of my favorite topics. But when you give people time to think, they can then actually be empowered. And anyone from a five-year-old to a 105-year-old, most people do not have the opportunity to think for themselves. They don't, the other people don't give them the space. They're interrupted. That's why when you were struggling with the word accountability, I knew what it was. But I was like, I don't need to tell him. I want him to chew on it and figure it out because it's a service to you to let you think about it. Because now you're going to remember that word. If I would have just told you, you might have forgotten it and it won't have the same impact. Whatever impact it's supposed to have, it will have now instead of me interrupting your thoughts. Right. And we do this all the time to each other. And it's horrible. It's just damaging us. This is why we fight in culture all the time. This is why there's so much political dissension. We just run each, o- each other over. I digress. <laughs> but so time to think. And then my book right now, Leadership, would be the two recommendations. Um, to connect with me, GilletteSolutions.com is the easiest way. You can set up a 15-minute get-to-know-me, get-to-know-you type conversation. I, I love doing that. And then I'm on all the socials as Gillette Solutions is the, you know, the handle. So that's a great way to connect. Great. And we'll put links to that in the description. So no worries. But uh, yeah, thanks so much, Kyle. I appreciate you jumping on. It was great chatting. And hopefully we can keep in touch.